Hello, my name is Chris Hannum. Welcome to the first lecture of Eco 201E Economics, titled Principles of Economics. In this first lecture, what we'll try to get across is some fundamental concepts in economics, which are called principles of economics, some big ideas that all economists agree on, consider to be fundamental findings and results uh, from research in the field of economics. Um, before we get into these principles, I want to talk just for a minute about what economics is, or what economics is as far as economists are concerned. So what economics is as far as economists is concern, are concerned, just a little bit different than what you might naturally assume economics is about. You might naturally assume that what economics is about is the study of the economy. And the economy involves money, the economy involves business, the economy involves transactions and trade. Uh, but for an economist, what economics is all about is decision making. Specifically, economics is about decision making under certain special characteristics we call scarcity. Say, when we describe a resource as being scarce, what we mean is that there isn't enough of that resource for everyone to have as much as they want. We say there isn't enough, say, water for everyone to have as much as they want. There aren't enough automobiles for everyone to have as much as they want. There aren't enough workers for every business to have as much as they want. It's not necessary that we don't have enough to give everyone all that they need. Everyone could have all that they need, as many automobiles as they need, as much water as they need, as much housing as they need. But those goods could still be scarce as long as people wanted more than they had. And as long as people want more of something, that fundamental scarcity of that resource or that good or that time defines how it is that people will make decisions regarding it. So any type of decisions that people make, which involves these conditions of scarcity, is a decision which is of interest to economics, and is of interest to economists. It is the kind of decision and the kind of phenomenon that economists in the field of economics models and describes and analyzes and researches. So some examples of a trade-off that you might face in a condition of scarcity is that you might have scarce time. If you have scarce time, you can't do everything with your scarce time. You have to make decisions about how to use it. If you have scarce money, you can't use that money for everything that you would like to use it for. You have to make decisions about how to use that money. Now, these are kinds of decisions that a person or a business or a government would never need to make if money wasn't scarce or if time wasn't scarce. So all of these principles that we'll talk about, all of the kinds of uh, phenomena that we study involve these kinds of decisions made under conditions of scarcity. So these principles of economics we'll discuss, we put these in three different categories. The first category is decisions that are made by individuals. Now, these decisions that are made by individuals, this is the smallest scale of what economics describes and analyzes. This is what we refer to as microeconomics. At the other end, we'll describe some principles, a group of principles, about how society works. And these group of principles we classify as being macroeconomic principles. That's a study of very large things within economics. And in between, we have another category of principles, which are how individuals and groups of people interact with one another, not a whole society but not just one person either. And those would fall somewhere in the middle between the very micro and the most macro of the kinds of phenomena that economists study. Now, once again, these principles of economics are fundamental uh, outcomes of economic research and study, 
And they're among those things that most economists agree upon. We'll talk later in the next lecture about why it is that economists often do disagree. But for this point, just take my word for it. Economists disagree about far more than they agree about. But about these fundamental principles, all economists can agree. Now, the first of these principles is that people face trade-offs. Now, what we mean when people face trade-offs is that decisions that people make are made under conditions of scarcity. And those uh, decisions that people make under conditions of scarcity require them to make a choice of how to allocate a scarce resource, often money or time, not necessarily. And when they face this trade-off, when they make this decision, there's something else that they can't do. So as an example, if you have a midterm coming up for this economics course, the night before the midterm, there may be a number of things that you would like to do with your time. But because your time is fundamentally scarce, this decision involves a trade-off. If you choose to spend your time studying for the midterm, you're forced to give up something else that you might like to do very much with that time. Perhaps you can't watch a television program. Perhaps you can't go to a party with your friends. Perhaps you can't spend the meal with your family. Because that time can only be used for one of those on three, four, five potential activities. Those kinds of decisions involve trade-offs. Also, if you decide to move to a larger apartment, for example, and your rent goes up from 1,000 to 2,000, this 1,000 every month is money you can't spend on something else. So the trade-off involved in moving to a larger apartment means you've sacrificed other things in order to have the larger apartment. And none of the decisions that you'd be likely to make, uh, at least economically relevant decisions, would be decisions that do not involve a trade-off. Where you can have all things, you can do all things, you can be all things. If you choose to go to E2, you have to choose not to do something else with your time, with your years, with your life. If you choose to get a job in a particular field, your trade-off in this decision is that you're not able to pursue a career in some other field. All of these important decisions in your life will be made involving trade-offs. Well, the next principle, is a closely related principle in economics, is the principle that the cost of something, the cost of anything, is directly related to the trade-off involved in the decision that you made. The cost of something is whatever it is that you gave up, whatever it is that you sacrificed in order to get it or in order to do it. To be more precisely put, the cost of something is the value to you of whatever it is that you had to give up in order to get it or in order to do it. We would say the cost to you of studying for that midterm for your economics course. The cost to you is the value to you of the party you don't go to with your friends. Or the value to you of spending time on your couch watching a television program. Or the value to you of having a dinner with your family. Or potentially the value to you of studying for a different midterm. Whatever it is that you would have done if you hadn't decided to study for that economics midterm, determines the cost to you of studying the economics midterm. Now, what we describe this cost as, and this in economics is taken to be the fundamental form of cost, the fundamental definition of cost. We describe this as being an opportunity cost. That is the value of a lost opportunity. The value of the opportunity to do something, to buy something, to have something, to be something that you sacrificed, that you gave up in order to do whatever it is that you decided to do, in order to study for the midterm, in order to buy, or in order to rent a larger apartment, whatever it is that you decided to do. 
Now, there are, of course, other definitions of cost. We could describe the cost to you of studying for that midterm as five hours. Or we could describe the cost to you of renting a larger apartment as 1000 But that cost would be missing a critical, that definition, that measure of cost, would be missing a critical part of the true cost, which is how valuable that five hours was to you at that very moment, or how valuable that 1000 would be to you, because it might be very different than the value of that 1000 to a different person, or the value to you of that 1000 two years in the future, or two years in the past. Or the value of that five hours the night before the midterm might be very different than the value to you of five hours one day before or one week before. Because the opportunities that you would have been faced with would have been different. And whatever it is that you had the opportunity to do, or the opportunity to have, or the opportunity to be, but ultimately did not do or have or be, that's what determines the cost of whatever decision you made. The third principle, again in the category of microeconomic principles, the third principle is a little bit more complicated. Maybe the first two principles, that people face trade-offs and that the cost of something is what you gave up to get it, maybe these are self-explanatory. Maybe these make intuitive sense. The third principle is that rational people think at the margin. Now, Within the context of economic theory, this makes perfect sense. This is part of the building block and the assumptions underlying a lot of our theories about consumers, our theories about individual decisions, our theories about how economic people work. But it takes a little bit of explaining to understand what it is exactly that economists mean by this. Because the idea of a person being rational isn't quite intuitive. Or the idea of thinking at the margin, or even what the margin is, isn't necessarily all that intuitive. Now, in economics as a field, we use a lot of jargon, of course. We use a lot of specialized terminology within the field of economics. But unlike many other fields, this specialized terminology and jargon, these are words that have meanings outside of economics but the meanings outside of economics are just a little bit different. They have a very special and a very specific meaning within economics. So first to describe what it is that it means in economics for a person to be rational. Now, if a person is rational, we say that that person has some kind of goals. So there's something that that person wants from their life. It could be any number of different things. We don't have to agree with what that person wants or that person's goals. We don't have to know what those person's goals are. We just say that the person has them. And given that the person has these goals, if the person is rational, everything that that person does is done with those goals in mind. Whatever it is that that person wants out of life, the decisions that they make, they make in order to get what they want out of life, to have more of what they want, to be what they want, to do what they want. Now, that doesn't mean that a rational individual needs to be selfish. A rational person could care a great deal, for example, about their family. And if they care a great deal about their family and what they want is for their family to be well off, what they want is for their family to be happy, then a rational person will make decisions that try as best as they're able to make their family happy, among the other goals that this person has. So if we say a person is rational, that means it's first, the person has goals, and second, the decisions that a person makes move them toward those goals. If a person is rational, the person fits those characteristics. Now next, what do we mean by the margin? Or what do we mean by thinking at the margin, making decisions at the margin? What we mean by the margin, which is a term borrowed from, from math, because the models on which these theories are based and the models in which these theories are incorporated are highly mathematical. Thinking at the margin 
means taking one plan in advance, one plan of action, and incrementally making small adjustments to it over time. That's to say, we may make a decision in advance that we're going to buy two large pizzas, and we're going to eat two large pizzas. Now, if we don't think at the margin, we would simply follow the decision that we've already made to buy and eat two large pizzas and continue to eat and eat and eat and eat without any potential to adjust that plan. Now, if we do think at the margin, we would continually adjust over time as new information becomes available to us, continually adjust that plan to buy and eat two large pizzas. We would eat one slice or even take one bite of a slice and then incrementally continue to adjust our decision to eat more or not. So we would be continually making the decision, am I full or am I still hungry? Am I full or am I still hungry? Am I full or am I still hungry? Say if a person is rational, that person would think at the margin and that person would incrementally decide to eat another bite or not based on how hungry they were. They wouldn't simply make an advanced plan to eat two large pizzas and stick to it even if they were extremely full and did not want the last piece of pizza. So if a person is rational, then that person will think at the margin. Because this basic idea, this principle of economics, is that if a person is rational, that means that whatever it is the person wants, they should be doing everything they can to get it. And if they're not thinking at the margin, then they're not going to be doing everything they can to get whatever it is that they want. Their behavior would be suboptimal. One other thing to clarify about what it means when we say that a person is rational, therefore a person should be making decisions at the margin. A person's ability or capacity to make a perfect plan and follow it to get the most of whatever it is that they want is limited. And the person can still be rational even if they're not able to get exactly what it is that they want. We say the person is rational if to the best of their ability they make decisions, make plans to the best of their ability to get what it is that they want, to, to pursue the goals that they have. And if they're doing this, they will necessarily be making decisions at the margin. There's no way in which it could be optimal, that it could be considered rational to simply buy two pizzas and eat them all no matter how hungry you became. Now, the last of our principles of individual behavior, of how individual people make decisions, is a little bit tautologically true. Our fourth principle is that people respond to incentives. And we just mentioned in the context of principle three that much of what we talk about in, in economics involves special jargon where a term or a, a word means something very specific within the field. And incentives is another economics term like that. Incentives could mean a variety of different, slightly different things outside of economics. But in economics, it means something quite specific. An incentive is something that induces people to act. So an incentive is something which does and can change people's behavior. So based on how we define incentives, this is true by definition. And people respond to incentives. People respond to things designed in order to change their behavior. So now, what, what would that look like? What would an incentive be in economics? So if people make decisions, this decisions that people make factor in opportunity costs, that cost of the trade-off involved in all of the decisions that people are making. And we assume that people are rational and that rational people think at the margin so people can adjust whatever plans they've held for a long time and they may adjust those plans based on changes in the opportunity cost. The incentives we mostly talk about in economics are incentives that attempt to change the opportunity cost involved in a decision that people might make, to change the terms of the trade-off. As an example, 
if we want to influence as a society the decision that people make to smoke cigarettes how could we do this well we assume that when people decide to smoke cigarettes those decisions are made with trade-offs because cigarettes cost money people have to decide to buy cigarettes or something else they sacrifice something else in order to buy cigarettes the cost of the cigarettes the fundamental cost wouldn't be the money, it would be whatever else you would do with the money, but if we cause a pack of cigarettes to cost more money, then people would be forced to give up more of something else in order to get it. The opportunity cost would rise, just like the monetary cost of a pack of cigarettes would rise. And if we assume that people are rational, therefore they think at the margin, then we would assume that people could incrementally adjust their decision to smoke more cigarettes or to continue to smoke cigarettes, to buy one pack rather than two or to buy one block rather than two. And that incentive takes the form of a cigarette tax. And we find through empirical economic research that people, especially teenagers, do in fact react to higher taxes on cigarettes. This disincentive to smoke, a negative incentive, incentive not to smoke, by smoking less. Now, some people respond to incentives more than other people. And for the most part, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds that have been smoking cigarettes for years, they continue to smoke cigarettes in spite of the fact that we've increased the opportunity cost through a tax. However, Teenagers who haven't been smoking for very long or are still deciding whether or not to begin smoking cigarettes have been found empirically to respond much more to the same incentive. Our next group of principles will move a little bit away from these uh, microeconomic principles of how individuals make decisions and towards the macroeconomic principles by looking at how people interact. Our fifth principle of economics is that trade can make everyone better off. Now, on the most micro level, the kind of trade that we're talking about could be the trade between two people. So suppose what we have in our economy, we have a small village economy and we have one rancher, we have one shepherd, and that shepherd has goats but doesn't grow any vegetables, doesn't grow any grain. And we have another individual, that individual is a farmer. That individual grows vegetables, that individual grows wheat, but that individual doesn't have any goats, doesn't have any cows, doesn't have any sheep. Now, if these two individuals are what we call self-sufficient, those two individuals would need to do everything that they, they want to produce goods for their own consumption. So if they want to have meat, they need to produce it themselves. If they want to have vegetables, they need to grow them themselves. If they want to have bread, they need to grow the grain, they need to bake the bread themselves. If they want a house, they need to build it themselves. If they want wood to make a house out of, they need to chop those trees down themselves. If they want medical care, they have to treat themselves. If they want their children to have an education, they need to educate them themselves. That's what's required if someone is genuinely self-sufficient and does not trade. And this fundamental principle of economics, at the most micro level, that those two people could benefit not by remaining self-sufficient and never interacting, never trading with anyone else, but by specializing in one thing they're best at and trading some of that with their neighbors for something they're not as good at producing. So the farmer, could take some of their extra vegetables and extra grain and exchange them with the ranch for some of the meat that they're not producing themselves. And that both would be better off. Both would have a better diet, both would have a higher standard of living. In the same vein, that village might have a doctor. And the rancher and the farmer and everyone else there may be better off specializing in producing a variety of other things and exchanging those things for medical care, 
than if they tried to provide all of their own medical care for themselves. That village might also have a teacher, and all of the farmers, and ranchers, and the doctor, and everyone else may be better off if they specialize in producing food, medical care, whatever else, and exchanging some of those things with the teacher for education. At the most micro level, that's what we mean when we say that trade can make everyone better off. That one individual who tries to build their own house, grow all their own vegetables, all their own meat, chop down all their own trees, educate their own children, treat their own uh, diseases, that individual will not have a very high standard of living compared to people who do interact with one another, do trade with one another, and specialize in something that they're uniquely good at producing, uniquely good at doing. Like the doctor is uniquely good at providing medical care. Now, at a more macro level, economists believe that this basic idea that trade between individuals can make all individuals better off carries over to regions, cities, nations as well. The idea is that a nation could specialize in production of one good or a variety of goods, that that nation was relatively efficient, relatively good at producing, and then sell some of those goods to other countries, exchange some of those goods with other countries for other goods that that country wasn't quite as good at producing. As an example, Turkey does not have a lot in the way of hydrocarbon reserves. So Turkey doesn't have a lot of oil, doesn't have a lot of natural gas, but Turkey does have some. Now, if Turkey was self-sufficient in the same way that the farmer or the rancher could be self-sufficient, that would mean Turkey as a nation had to produce everything that it wanted to consume. So if Turkey wanted to have oil, it would need to produce all of that oil itself. If Turkey wanted to have natural gas, it would need to produce all of that natural gas itself. And now, given the limited oil resources and natural gas resources in the ground, producing it in Turkey is quite expensive. So if Turkey as a nation were to be self-sufficient, what we would mean by that is that Turkey would not trade with any other country. Turkey would have to produce all of its own goods for its own consumption. And as we established, there are certain goods like natural gas, like petroleum, that Turkey would not be able to produce very efficiently without being able to get them from other countries. And these goods, if Turkey was self-sufficient, would be extremely expensive. Its electricity also in Turkey might be extremely expensive. Fuel would be extremely expensive. Transportation might be quite expensive in general. Now, there are other goods as well, not only hydrocarbons in the ground, that are quite difficult to produce in Turkey or that where Turkey's productivity is not exceptionally high. Or in mind, if Turkey were to be self-sufficient and not trade with any other country, then you would only be able to buy a Turkish cell phone. You would only be able to buy Turkish cars. You would only be able to buy Turkish clothes. You would only be able to drink coffee if that coffee was grown in Turkey. Now, if Turkey is not self-sufficient or does not try to be self-sufficient, just like a farmer or rancher or doctor does not try to be self-sufficient, then Turkey's ability to consume coffee or Turkey's ability to consume natural gas isn't dependent on Turkey's ability to produce it. Turkey could be able to trade with some other country where it was produced very cheaply. So Turkey, for example, could buy coffee from Indonesia, where it's grown quite cheaply. Turkey could buy natural gas from Russia, Azerbaijan, where it's produced quite cheaply. And Tur uh, Turkish people would be able to get much cheaper natural gas, much cheaper coffee, etc., than they would if Turkey were a self-sufficient country that did not trade. But how could Turkey do that? How could Turkey buy it from some other country? What would Turkey need to do? Well, just like a farmer might need to take some of the vegetables, some of the grain that they produced, and exchange them with a rancher to get meat, and exchange them with a doctor for medical care, exchange them with a teacher in exchange for education, 
Turkey as a nation would need to produce more of something and exchange it for the things that Turkey isn't going to produce. Or exchange it for the things that Turkey isn't going to produce very much of. Things like natural gas, things like coffee. And what does Turkey produce in excess? These are Turkey's exports. Turkey's exports are things like construction services, tourism, textiles, automobile parts. Turkey might produce more of these things than are necessary for Turkish consumption with a specific goal of taking those to international markets and exchanging them for the things that Turkey can't produce cheaply. Now, what we mean in this principle of economics, this idea that just about all economists can agree on, is that trade between individuals like the farmer and the rancher and the doctor and the teacher can make everyone better off. Trade between nations, as between Turkey and Russia and Turkey and Indonesia, can also make both Turkey and Russia better off, not only Russia and not only Turkey, and can make both Turkey and Indonesia better off, not only Turkey or not only Indonesia, and that there would be some potential terms of trade, some trading price, which both countries could agree on, which would be beneficial for both. And if trade did occur, and trade was voluntary, then it should be within this range of prices where everybody would be happy and everybody would be better off. The next of our principles, how people interact, moves a little farther yet away from the idea of microeconomic, small-scale decision-making and small-scale phenomena uh, to larger-scale market-level phenomena. This is groups of people interacting with one another rather than individuals interacting with one another. Okay, principle number six is that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Now note here, I mentioned before, these principles of economics, these big ideas in economics, these fundamental results of economic theory and research, these are things that most economists agree on, and they're framed and phrased in such a way that economists can agree on. No, with our principle number three, rational people think at the margin, this doesn't state that all people think at the margin, and it doesn't state that all people are rational, because fewer economists would agree with those statements than economists would agree with a statement that rational people think at the margin. So here we say, for principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Not necessarily that trade does make everyone better off. There could be some people in the country who are not better off with trade. For example, people who might have worked in the natural gas sector in Turkey might benefit from an extremely high price in a self-sufficient Turkey. And in the same vein, with principle six, when we say specifically markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity, I mean most if not all economists can agree with that statement. But not as many economists would agree with a statement, the stronger statement, that markets are always a good way to organize economic activity. Now, what do we mean here when we say market? Again, just as with margin and rational and incentive, this is a specific term within economics that means a little bit something else outside of economics than what it means inside of economics. What a market means within the field of economics is any group of people representing all potential buyers of a product and all potential sellers of a product. Now, they could be located in one place or they could be spread out over the entire world. They could be making these transactions face-to-face -face or electronically. Now, in olden days, the market likely would have been a physical place more often than not. In the modern economy, the market is generally not a physical place, or may not even have a physical place which represents that market, such as a stock exchange. But that market representing all the buyers and all the sellers of that market is just a huge group of people. That huge group of people makes many decisions to buy not to buy, to sell, not to sell, to buy this much, to buy that much, to sell this much, to sell that much. 
And if we say that markets organize economic activity, that organization of economic activity means that a certain set of decisions are made for society as a whole. Things like, what will the price of that good be? How much of that good will be produced? Let's say our good in question is bread, and we're looking at the bread market. So if markets are organizing this economic activity, then markets are deciding, directly or indirectly, how much bread will cost. They're deciding how much bread will be produced. They're deciding how bread will be produced. They're deciding who will produce that bread. And they're deciding who will buy and have that bread. All of those are aspects of the organization of economic activity. That's how much it will cost, how much of it will be made, how it will be made, by who it will be made, by who it will be consumed. And if we say that markets are usually a good way to organize act economic activity, we mean that when many, many people make their own individual decisions to buy bread, to buy three loaves of bread or two loaves of bread, to buy five loaves of bread or ten loaves of bread, to bake a thousand loaves of bread or two thousand loaves of bread, to open the bakery or to close the bakery, which flour to use, which ingredients to use when baking that bread, how many people to hire in order to bake that bread, which neighborhood to bake that bread in. Those kinds of individual decisions made by individual bakers, made by individual bread buyers, all aggregate together to determine how economic activity is organized. So we have many individual bakers deciding how much bread they want to bake. The outcome at the level of the entire market is a decision about a certain amount of bread to be baked. Many individual people decide seeing a price that they want to buy or don't want to buy. And those individual decisions that they make wind up organizing economic activity in terms of who it is that buys and has the bread that's baked. And when we say that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity, what we mean is that we can look at those outcomes for how economic activity winds up being organized, for how much bread is baked, for who gets the bread that is baked, for which bakeries bake the bread that is baked, which bakeries bake more, which bakeries bake less, what ingredients they use, how many people they hire, how much it costs to bake the bread, what price they charge for the bread, all of those things. And if markets are a good way to organize economic activity, we like those outcomes. We like, generally speaking, the amount of bread that is baked. We like, generally speaking, the way that the bread is baked. We like, generally speaking, where the bread is baked and by who the bread is baked. And we like, generally speaking, who buys the bread and has the bread and what the price of the bread will be as compared to other potential ways to organize economic activity. For an alternative to economic activity organized by a market could be, for example, a command economy. A command economy is like uh, the economy of North Korea, where there are bureaucrats in offices making these decisions, not the market. And these bureaucrats tell each baker how much they should bake. And they tell each baker how they should bake the bread that they'll bake. And they tell uh, each baker how many people they will hire. And they tell each person how much bread they are allowed to have. And they tell uh, the bakers what the price of the loaf of bread will be. That's an alternative way to organize economic activity, where these decisions aren't made by the market, by many, many individual people deciding to buy or not to buy, or to bake more or to bake less. And if we say that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity, all that we mean is that, generally speaking, we like the way the decisions are made. We prefer the decision about the amount of bread to be baked when it's made by a market as compared to when it's made by command economy or by a bureaucrat. 
it's more likely to be close to what we think is the best amount of bread to be baked. Or the price that they charge tends to be closer to the best price to be charged. Or the way that it's baked is closer to the best way for it to be baked. So that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Now, there are certain things, of course, that we would like to get out of our economy that we're not naturally able to achieve from a market. There's certain logic in the way markets make these decisions. This is described to the extent that these uh, outcomes tend to be good for the economy or, or maybe better for society and better for the economy than we would naturally expect, given that these individual decisions are made largely due solely to self-interest. People don't consider the well-being of society when they decide how much bread to bake or what price to charge. People don't consider the well-being of society when they choose to buy two loaves instead of one. They think about whether they want it or not, and their concerns are fairly narrow. But the broad outcome is often as though they were all making decisions with the best interests of society in mind. And in a well-functioning, competitive economy, we could have these market decisions about how to organize economic activity, for example, that wound up with bread being baked by the cheapest bakeries and not more expensive bakeries. The cheaper bakeries would force more expensive bakeries out of business. Those were more efficient, better managed, better run. So our economy as a whole would have a lower cost for bread. Now, if that economic activity was organized by a bureaucrat, we wouldn't necessarily have that expectation. And our outcome might be better if we left it up to the market, the competitive market to decide. And the idea that a competitive market without any need for a visible hand from government or a visible hand from the king would give us economic outcomes which were good, even though no one had the best interests of society in mind, was the big idea that Adam Smith, in his first big writing in classical economic theory, The Wealth of Nations, described as the invisible hand. That invisible hand of the market is what he described as leading market economic outcomes or market organization of economic activity to be in the best interests of society. Now, through two centuries of economic theory, two th centuries of economic research after Adam Smith, what we've realized is that the invisible hand is something quite specific. The invisible hand is the price. And that market price, if the market is allowed to make the decision about what the price of a good should be, given enough competition in the market, certain characteristics of the market and the products, that price will adjust to cause the market economic organization of activity to be desirable. Take one example. Suppose we're looking at that bread market again, just for hypothetical sake. And in that bread market, for whatever reason, everyone decided to charge a price for bread that was far too high. Now, if everyone decided to charge a price for bread that was far too high, those bakers would want to bake a lot of bread. They would think they could get a lot of money for that bread. It would be very profitable to produce all of that bread. But the people who, who are consumers of bread, they would want to consume less. They might think about buying other things instead of bread, and their consumption would fall. All those individual decisions made by those individual potential bread buyers if the price of bread was too high, they would make the decision to buy less of it. But all those individual bread bakers would notice as people buy less that a lot of bread is being baked, it's piling up, stacking up, not being sold. And they would react to this by cutting the price that they charge to try to find somebody to buy the bread that they've been baking. And the end result would be an adjustment in the price over time until the price was just the right price. And again, the quantity of bread baked was just the right quantity. Next, as I mentioned, 
Although there are certain things that we like about the way markets organize economic activity, like the amount of bread that's baked and the quality of the bread that's baked and the way that the bread is baked, the locations the bread is baked, all of these things. We like these things. There are other things that we don't necessarily like about the way markets organize economic activity. Which leads us to principle number seven, or how people interact, that governments can sometimes intervene in a market to improve economic activity. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that governments can always intervene uh, in a market to improve economic activity. In economics, we define some very specific circumstances where there's a definite role for government to play because there's some kind of an economic outcome something that we want from the economy, something that we want from society that the market is not able to give us, or there's something flawed about the market that prevents the market, all these individual decisions made by all of the participants in the market, from giving us an outcome which is desirable, causes this um, invisible hand to fail, causes the invisible hand to break down. Now, the first of these ways that a government can definitely intervene to improve economic outcomes as compared to a situation in which the government uh, did not intervene and we left all of these uh, decisions, all of these outcomes up to the market alone, is that there's a role for the government to play in defining and protecting property rights. So what is a property right? The property right is simply a legal right to have the thing that you own and to continue to have the thing that you own. For everyone to trust and value that that thing is yours. Now, if we have a situation where property rights are weak or property rights don't exist at all, why would someone be interested in producing bread or producing automobiles or buying and owning an automobile? if they had no ability to protect the thing that they had made to ensure that they could sell it for a profit or to protect the thing that they had bought to be able to be sure that they could continue to use it. So if all automobiles are likely to be stolen within the first week of being purchased, automobile sales will be low. If all automobiles are stolen within one week of being put on a dealer's lot, very few automobiles would be produced. Now, the only way that a market economy with no role for a government to solve this fundamental problem, no one has an interest in producing or buying or having anything that they can't protect, is private security. And private security to protect your own automobile is quite expensive. And private security to protect the automobiles that you've produced and have for sale on the lot, so quite expensive. So if the government is able to protect your right to own a car that you own, or right, is able to protect your right to own land that you own, able to protect your right to continue to own and operate the bakery that you own, this means preventing crime, fundamentally, preventing theft. And the government, by and large, can do this much more effectively, much more efficiently than private security could ever do. And if the government intervenes to protect property rights, we see an economy much like we do in most of the world, where you may buy a car and trust that you will continue to be able to own that car. And the market functions. Now, the next role for uh, government in an economy clearly defined role for the government in the economy, is that the invisible hand may certain times fail. There may be certain characteristics of a market or certain characteristics of a good that cause that market to fail. One of these is what we describe as market power. That's to say, market power is one situation which causes a market to fail to give us desirable economic outcomes or to organize economic activity in a desirable way. If we have market power, that means that either the supply side of the market, the businesses that produce these goods, 
is too concentrated, or the demand side, the buyers of this good in the market, they're too concentrated. And if they're too concentrated, they can exercise power over the market as a whole. So suppose we have just one company, and that one company produces clothing for our entire market. It's a monopoly. A monopoly is a market which is dominated by just one producer. That monopoly firm, which produces clothing, could charge potentially whatever they wanted for clothing if you had no other option than to buy clothing from them. Now, there's no reason to believe if there's only one clothing company which produces clothing that you would necessarily get desirable outcomes from that market. Would you get just the right, of cl uh, right amount of clothing produced that you want to see produced? Would you get the right kinds of clothing produced that you want to see produced? Would you get it produced in the right way with the best possible quality? Would you have the right price charged for clothing that is best for society as a whole? Would you have the right people consuming it? Would you have the right number of people hired to work in the uh, clothing industry? If the market is competitive, made up of many buyers and many sellers, we would be likely to be happy with all of those outcomes. But if the market is dominated by just one seller, a monopoly, we probably wouldn't be. We would probably see that the market price, that, that way that the market has decided to organize economic activity, is too high. And the market quantity produced is too low. And the way that the goods are produced in the market is likely to be inefficient. The quality of those goods is not going to be as high as the quality that we would like to see. The number of people hired for those businesses is lower than the number we would like to see. And there's nothing in the logic of the market if we have just one firm for some invisible hand to lead us to a desirable outcome. If we have just one firm, the market leads us to an undesirable outcome. And if we have an undesirable outcome from our market economy, there's no one else who can step in and intervene and protect us from this uh, market outcome. And there's a role for the government to intervene and either force that monopoly, one firm that produces the good, to behave as though they were competitive, is behave as though there were other country, companies that competed with them, to charge a lower price, just like they would if there were other companies competing with them, or to produce more of the good, just as they would if there were other companies competing with them. Or the government could step in, intervene, and actually force competition to take place. Sometimes some governments have done this. Governments have taken one big company and broken that company up into many pieces. As with the old telecoms monopoly in the United States, or the old oil monopoly in the United States. Broke it up into many companies and forced those companies to compete with one another. Now, we may not get an outcome which is as desirable as a market without a source of market failure in this situation with market power, if the government does intervene. But if the government does intervene, they may still be able to improve economic outcomes uh, above what they would have been if we simply allowed a monopoly to function as it wished. Well, there are other sources of market failure as well, in addition to market power, that have to do with the characteristics of the market or the characteristics of the good, rather than the level of competition. One of those is if our good involves externalities, is the product that's being consumed, involves what we call an externality. Now, that is a, is a special term in economics, a piece of economics jargon, that doesn't mean anything at all outside of economics. You'll often find if you write externalities in when you try to write an online quiz, you'll get it autocorrected. This is not outside economics, even a word. Externalities within economics does also refer to something specific about what happens when that good is consumed or about what happens when that good is produced. Generally speaking, if, if there's no externality involved, when we buy and consume a good, 
we think about our own benefit and the person who produced it and sold it, they thought about their own benefit. And when I buy it, I give them money, they get benefit. And when I consume it, I get a benefit. And there is in fact no one else affected in any way. Now, if I don't care about the fact that other people might be affected, but they aren't affected, this isn't a problem. Externalities arise for different kinds of goods where other people near me are affected. But still, when I make the decision to buy it and consume it, I don't think about them. When other people make the decision to produce it and sell it, they don't think about them. And that transaction that takes place in the market takes place ignoring the needs of those people who happen to be affected nearby. What kind of a good might that be? Something about the way it's consumed or something about the way it's produced affects other people nearby that have no connection to it. So an easy example is a cigarette. If I make the decision to buy and smoke a cigarette, I think about my own benefit or my own health. And the company that uh, produced the cigarettes, they thought about their own revenues and profits. And the company that sold me that pack of cigarettes, they thought about their own revenues and their own profits. But nobody there really thought very much about the people who happen to be sitting next to me in the coffee shop while I smoke it. So if these economic decisions are made to buy, produce cigarettes, to smoke cigarettes, without any consideration for people nearby, I might make the decision to buy and smoke cigarettes that I thought was worthwhile, so to speak, from my perspective. But it might not be worthwhile for society's perspective. See, part of what we mean when we say that we like the way that, uh, that markets organize economic activity, we like the amount of whatever it is that's bought and sold, as opposed to more or opposed to less, is that if the benefit outweighs the cost, markets generally will produce that good. They'll produce that good up to the level where the benefit is equal to the cost, but no more. Now, the benefit may be greater than the cost to me, or the benefit may be greater than the cost to me and the cigarette producer, cigarette seller combined, but there may be additional cost that additional cost falls on people that happen to be near me while I'm smoking these cigarettes. And if I factored those costs in when I decided to smoke the cigarette, buy the cigarette or not, maybe I would have decided not to. But because I didn't, I decided to smoke it when it was not in society's best interest for me to do that. Well, that's a very small scale example of this kind of externality. Larger scale uh, examples might involve, say, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Pollution is a classic case of negative externalities. And we can have positive externalities as well. Now, a negative externality is something that harms people nearby. But a positive externality would be something that happens to help people nearby, but something that I didn't really think about when I was making the decision to do it. For example, suppose I live in the village and I decide to paint my house. I think about the benefit that I will get and the cost to me of painting my house. But I don't think about the benefit to my neighbors of my painting that house. And the benefit to the neighbors could be just enough that it would make it worthwhile for me to paint that house. That positive externality. It gives some additional happiness to my neighbors that my house looks nice, and it may increase the value of their homes if they want to sell them and give them some benefit in that way. We also have a classic case of a positive externality in vaccines. Well, suppose we look at a measles vaccine, a disease measles. Now, if I get a measles vaccine, I have to spend some money, endure some unpleasantness to get the shot. And what I'm mainly concerned about is the risk that I will contract that disease. And I want to prevent myself from contracting that disease. And I think narrowly about my own personal benefit and my own personal cost. But if I get that vaccine, 
The fact that I will not get that disease means that I can't possibly spread that disease to anybody else. And if I got that disease, I could potentially spread that disease to a hundred other people. Th those hundred other people getting that disease could be much, much more cost than the risk of the disease to me myself. It might be justified for me to get that vaccine just to protect other people. But I wouldn't naturally be expected, through the logic of the market, to take them into consideration. So what could cause me to take them into consideration? Well, we imagine that if the government doesn't do it, probably nothing will. And certain small-scale externality issues, maybe some social pressures, some concern for people who, who I live with may induce me to change my behavior. But on a larger scale, it's likely that it would require government to put policies in place to create incentives, because as we've already established, people respond to those. Government could create incentives for people to smoke less by raising the price of cigarettes. Or the government could put policies in place to provide an incentive to get a measles vaccine by making it free or even by making it mandatory. Now, the last case I'm going to talk about where the government can sometimes improve economic outcomes so if we don't have a market failure per se, so nothing is preventing the market from organizing economic activity in ways that are normally good. So we have competition as opposed to market power. We have goods without externalities. Government is already insuring property rights. There's also nothing in the logic of the market that would ensure that that market outcome is fair. The last part of how markets organize economic activity, I already mentioned, when markets economic, organize economic activity, markets make a decision about who it is that will have and consume the good. The market both decides to produce a certain number of automobiles, sell those automobiles for a certain price, and also makes decisions about who it is that will have an automobile, and which one, and how, and, uh, how many? Now, there's nothing necessarily to say, although there may be certain desirable characteristics about how that allocation takes place, that that allocation will be fair. Because on the one hand, the market ensures that only people who want automobiles buy them. Now that's good. We don't want a market organizing economic activity in such a way that people who don't want automobiles get them and people who do want automobiles don't. But markets also organize ec economic activity not just to give them to people who want them, but to give them to people who are willing to pay for them. And people are willing to pay for them first because they want them, and second because they have the money to do so. We may have many people who would like, maybe need, automobiles, but do not have the money to buy them with. They may in fact want or need them more than the people who do have money to buy those automobiles with. To that extent, if this is something we want from our economy, that people who need things can have them, people who want things badly enough can have them, even if they don't have very much money to spend, the market, based on its own internal logic, is not likely to provide us with that. And if the market can't do it on its own, there's a potential role for the government to step in to ensure that the market's economic outcomes are more fair than they otherwise would have been. To ensure that the poor have more money than they otherwise would have. Or they have better access to goods that they need than they otherwise would have if they were forced to compete with everyone who was willing to pay more because they had higher incomes. Now, the other way the government can step in to make economic outcomes more fair is through direct income transfers. And we often see these. The government steps in and taxes people with relatively high incomes. And they use the revenues from those taxes to provide pensions, 
to provide some uh, supplementary welfare payments for people that are poor, or to fund public services which are primarily used and needed by people who are poor and can't otherwise afford to pay for these services themselves. So when the government intervenes to make our economy more fair, they may do this by providing pensions for the elderly. The elderly may not be able to work. They may not otherwise have very many opportunities to earn an income and buy goods and services. The government uh, intervenes in the economy in order to provide things like free education, in order to provide free or heavily subsidized health care. This is something that a government can do to make the economic outcomes from a market economy more fair than they otherwise would have been without necessarily any need to completely reorganize economic activity along the lines of a command economy. Next, I want to move on to the third set of principles of economics, principles about how society works. Now, the first of those at the societal level is that a nation's standard of living in people's ability to consume things, to have more of everything, to have larger homes, to have cars and televisions, to have food. Their standard of living depends on a country's ability to produce all of those goods. Now, if we imagine, as I mentioned before, that a country is self-sufficient, so the country does not trade, the only way people in that country can have goods to consume is if those goods are produced in that country. So if that was true, this would be uh, almost tautologically true. However, if a country's standard of living here depends on its ability to produce, what we mean is that even in the case where a country is not self-sufficient, is not closed, and does trade with other countries, although there may be a variety of other factors that influence standard of living, such as how cheaply they're able to get natural gas from Russia and Azerbaijan, still fundamentally, that country's standard of living still depends on the country's ability to produce goods and services. If we look at some stylized facts about the world economy, what we can see is that even when we account for variation in prices for housing and electricity and food and things like that, which do vary quite a bit from country to country, the richest countries in the world, like, say, uh, Singapore, Switzerland, the United States, Norway, are as much as 10 times as well off. The standard of living for people living in that country is 10 times as high as it is for people in the poorest countries with the lowest incomes, lowest standard of living. There are countries like Chad, Niger. We also notice that over the past hundred years or so of economic history, and we can't really go easily back farther than a hundred years because we don't have very much good economic data if we go back 200, 300, 400 years. So the United States, people in the United States have standard of living that's eight times as high as it was a hundred years ago. And people in the United States have a standard of living that's 10 times what it is in Niger. Why? Why are these gaps in standard of living so high? Well, it isn't because the price for the goods that Americans want to buy relative to what they want to sell has become so low, or the price for the goods they produce in Niger and want to sell abroad has become so low. It isn't because their terms of trade and the ability to make transactions with people in other countries has disappeared. The reason that these standards of living in these two countries, or this one country over time, differs so greatly is because productivity also differs just as greatly between the United States and Niger, or between the United States today and the United States a hundred years ago. What we mean by productivity is the amount of output, whatever the good is in question, wheat, bread, cars, gasoline, whatever it is that one worker is able to produce. In simple terms, we can just take the number of people employed in a sector of the economy, take the total output in that sector of the economy, and divide it by the number of people employed. That gives us raw labor productivity. And that raw labor productivity 
in the United States in the auto manufacturing sector is much higher than it was 100 years ago. And labor productivity in the farming industry is much higher in the United States than it is in Niger. And this is the fundamental reason why we have such big differences in standard of living between those countries. And what determines then their standard of living is whatever determines their productivity. So if we're looking for a policy change that will lead our economy to grow, lead our economy to be larger, we should be looking for a policy change that will lead labor productivity to rise. As labor productivity rises, we're able to produce, our whole economy is able to produce more of all goods and services, and we'll be able to also consume more goods and services as a society. And what determines that productivity for labor is a relatively simple set of uh, characteristics. First, skills. We'd like our workers to have more skills, more experience, and better education. We would like our workers to have more equipment with which to work, more heavy machinery, more tools than they already do. And we would like our workers, in addition to skills and machinery, to have economic and pro productive processes that are better organized. Um, in economics, we refer to that organization at the business level, the organization of the firm as technology. The technology of organization of a business enhances productivity. So one example we could take from the business world is the way well, the restaurant McDonald's operates. We wouldn't think McDonald's as being a particularly high-tech company. The product that they produce is food. It's a burger. It's nothing special. What's special about the way that McDonald's operates is the way that their kitchen and the way that the front end of that restaurant is organized. In McDonald's headquarters, they have laboratories. And in those laboratories, they test tiny variations in the way that a cash register buttons are laid out, or the way that two uh, parts of their kitchen are arranged, and the distance between them, and where each person in that kitchen is situated and look for how they can increase the productivity, the speed with which they can deliver a burger, the number of seconds it takes between order and delivery, to shave it just by one second at a time. And over time, that research and development from McDonald's doesn't create any new products, but it makes the way that the McDonald's restaurant is organized more and more and more efficient. So it makes workers in McDonald's restaurants more and more and more productive. It means they're able to produce at a lower cost. That's what we mean by technology in the context of ability to produce, context of labor productivity. So we want our workers to have more skills. The government can achieve that kind of uh, outcome through education. We want our workers to have more and better equipment. Government could achieve this through investment incentives. And we want our workers to have a workplace which is organized with better technology. We could potentially achieve this through incentives for research and development, activities like they have going on at McDonald's. Next, for our ninth principle, again on how society works, I should point out beforehand that when we get into the very macroeconomic principles, we find that there are fewer and fewer and fewer key big ideas that just about all economists can agree on. There's more contention, more disagreement. So both our principles that we'll present are narrower, they're couched in special safe terms, and there are fewer things that we can mention at all. Most economists would agree that a country's standard of living depends on productivity. If productivity rises, standard of living will rise as well. And most economists agree that if the government prints too much money, an inevitable result, if the government prints too much money, will be that prices will rise. Now, this doesn't mean that whenever prices rise, it must have been caused by the government printing too much money. There can be a variety of reasons that why prices rise. But if the government does print a lot of extra money, most economists would agree that this will cause prices to rise. 
And we've observed this several points in recent economic history. When prices rise across the board, just to define one more term from economics, we call this inflation. General inflation in the price of goods and services. We don't mean specifically that the price of one good will rise because the government prints too much money. It's not specifically that the price of oil will rise or the price of tomatoes will rise when the government prints too much money. It's across the board the price of all goods and services. And that inflation rate could be 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%, 20%, for a variety of different reasons. But if that inflation rate is 1,000%, that means prices year on year are increasing 1,000%. Prices are 10 times as high as they were the year before. It's unlikely that there can be any cause for that level of inflation, level of inflation we call hyperinflation, other than the government simply printing too much money. So when does this kind of thing happen? Well, it happens despite the fact that all economists and policymakers understand it will cause prices to rise when governments have no other option for paying their payroll, for paying other bills, for paying the military. They have no other option, no other way to generate revenue other than to print money. But when governments need to print money in order to pay their bills, they cause prices to rise. When prices rise, their bills become more expensive. So over time, they need to print an exponentially larger, exponentially increasing amount of extra money to pay their bills. This is what ultimately leads to 1,000% inflation, 10 million percent inflation. The kind of inflation rates that we saw in the early 2000s in Zimbabwe, for example, or more recently in Venezuela. And in the most famous case, in Weimar, Germany, in between the two world wars. And the last of our principles for how society works, again, a macroeconomic principle, is that governments face a short-run trade-off in one specific area of macroeconomic policy making. Now, we know that if a government prints too much money, prices will rise, but the government might, under certain circumstances, want to print more money for a certain goal other than uh, to pay their bills. And this is monetary policy undertaken by central banks. Governments print money and give that money to banks in order for those banks to have more money to lend out in order to stimulate the economy, to push down interest rates, increase lending, increase economic growth, and decrease unemployment. If we task a central bank, one of the key economic policy-making bodies in the country, with two goals, we tell them we want growth and low unemployment. We want our economy to be, to be strong. But we also want prices to be stable and inflation to be low. Central banks don't have a lot of tools that they can use. And the tools that they have, such as printing money, giving it to banks so that banks will lend money out and stimulate the economy, those achieve the goal of reducing unemployment, but they also come with a cost of increasing inflation. So they're increasing the amount of money in the economy. They're decreasing the value of money in the economy. Now, if we give uh, the central bank the opposite priority and we tell that central bank we really want you to focus on price stability. We want you to reduce the amount of money in the economy. Take money out of the banking system so that interest rates will rise, economic activity will slow, and unemployment rises. Prices fall or stabilize. It has the desired effect on inflation, but it has the opposite effect on unemployment and one that we don't want. So most economists would agree not that we should necessarily focus on reducing unemployment or that we necessarily should focus on reducing inflation, but that if the central bank tries to focus on those two things, 
there's no policy that they can do under most circumstances to achieve both goals at the same time. That a central bank can try to keep unemployment down or inflation down, but not both. The last, we say this is a short run trade-off. It's a short-run trade-off, meaning that we're only looking at the next couple of years, for example. The effects of this policy this year, next year. We're not looking at the effects of this policy the government may follow 10 years from now. But that doesn't mean that there is no short-run trade-off, or there's no long-run, sorry, trade-off between unemployment and inflation. What it means is that there's nothing a central bank can actually do that will affect unemployment in the long run. The only thing the central bank can do in the long run is to target inflation and to try to keep inflation low. But in the long run, a policy that increases inflation won't have the side benefit of reducing unemployment. To a certain extent, that kind of a trade-off does not exist in the long run. There's no possibility to have a policy, a monetary policy, for the central bank that focuses on unemployment. Well, that wraps up our 10 principles of economics. These are the biggest ideas in economics, the most fundamental conclusions that we've drawn from several centuries of economic research. Now, next week, we'll pick up with an analysis of how it is that economists think how it is that economists do research, and what the role of an economist in society is. And we'll talk a little bit more about why it is that there are so few big ideas that most economists can generally agree on, and why it is that there's so much contention, so much disagreement about so many other topics in economics.